you know, by calling out Bangladesh as a success case and saying, look, I'm quite happy that that's a success. You know, this is quite imperfect institutions. There's definitely a lot of things imperfect there. So there is something there that you need to be willing to say, look, success is actually also defined in relative to your potential. And, you know, Malawi being a success is probably just growing a little bit faster. It will never be Singapore. And so you're willing to actually say something there that gets to act together. And, and it's not seeking perfection here. So you don't want to have this perfect thing. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. How and why do some countries win and others lose? My guest argues that the answer lies in elites with power and influence in countries with high levels of poverty. These elites must not just be committed to policies of economic growth and development, they must also make conscious political and economic choices that bolster such commitments. What is thus required is a development bargain. That is, actions in politics and economics supportive of political stability, economic growth and development. But it also entails a willingness to learn from mistakes. Development is a gamble because success is not guaranteed when benefits materialize in the long term and a host of factors may undermine elite positions. Some countries are able to settle on elite bargains that favor growth and development, and others are unable to reach such settlements. While elite bargains in China, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Ghana ended up being such development bargains, the opposite was the case in Nigeria, DRC, Malawi, and South Sudan. Stefan Durkon is professor at the Blavatnik School of Government and the Economics Department at the University of Oxford, where he also directs the Center for the Study of African Economies. His latest book, Gambling on Development, Why Some Countries Win and Others Lose, draws on his academic research and his policy experience across three decades. Thank you for your fantastic support to season four of the show. Please hit the subscribe button if you have not already done so and share the links to the show on social media. We always look forward to your questions, comments and suggestions. It's lovely to see you, Stefan. Wonderful book. I enjoyed reading it. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dan, for having me. I'm really pleased you enjoyed reading the book, and I look forward to our conversation. One of the first things I wanted to talk to you about was your amazing, fantastic, fascinating career as an academic. You're a professor at Oxford, but you've also been a policymaker. You've been chief economist of the erstwhile DFID. It doesn't exist anymore. You've been a policy advisor to the UK foreign secretary. So in this journey, Stefan, you appear to have personally become some sort of a bridge between the worlds of research and policy, something that is actually quite rare. So let me start by first asking you to reflect on this concept or the idea of development as you see it. And secondly, I would very much like you to reflect on how your thinking, your academic thinking has been shaped by this practical experience of being a senior official in international development? These are two great questions and, and potentially very big ones. So since you refer to my career and, 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 and the way I went about it, I will want to first make sure that you don't have the illusion that I all planted that this is how I was going to do it. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm actually an academic who was reluctant to become an academic because when I finished my PhD, I couldn't find a job, but as a postdoc, that was the only job that was taken. The World Bank didn't want me, the ODI fellowship, something in the UK, people do a lot working in ministries overseas, nobody wanted to take me. So, so I'm a bit of a reluctant academic in some sense at the time, but it's a really good question in terms of how do I think about development? You know, I, I got into development probably as most seriously as uh, about reading Amartya Sen. My mentor. 
Well, and I came to Oxford because Amartya Sen was at Oxford at the time. That was why I wanted to do the master's there. It was quite funny because he's been very influential in my career, but maybe not in the way that he kind of may think about it, if he at all ever were to think about it, is that when I got there, it, and it took me a year to get the courage to ask him, to get him to actually talk to me. And I said, look, I'm now doing a master's. I would love to do a PhD and I would love to do it under you and so on. And then he said, well, I have some, it's really nice and I'm looking forward to work with you, but I'll be at Harvard because I'm leaving for Oxford. <laughs> so I actually stumbled working on Africa. I'm doing this more as a statistical, you know, often the econometric analysis, data collection and so on. A lot to do because, well, he had gone. I could have been a very different type of economist. But the other part of the question is probably the more important one, which is this whole idea of, you know, what changes you if you don't stumble as I did again, you know, I got a job as chief economist at Diffit, not because I know anyone there, not because I'm an obvious choice, you know, I was a Belgian citizen, then there was no British passport, and you do it. What I definitely learned is that as academics, we love to reflect about what ought to happen. Yeah. So, and, and of course, Amartya Sen is totally, it's about normative economics, what development ought to be. While, you know, when you're sitting in a more policy environment, you know, what ought to be, you don't really get that much time for it. And, you know, what ought to be is that, you know, you would love children to have better education, better health, better things and whatever. And you don't really spend that much time thinking about all the different bits. You say, look, where if I have an opportunity to improve any of the 55 dimensions, I'm quite happy. But then the other part of it is that the problem is really not about what we ought to do. Once you sit in the policy space, it's so much more about the how, get it done. Exactly. How can we actually do this? And I think that's definitely changed me in terms of asking myself, you know, how can we actually get things to change? And, and arguably, that's where I come to now that once I joined DFIT, I had never really worked on political economy or on politics. I'm very interested in politics, always been. But then you start asking yourself, you know, why don't leaders across the world do these sensible things? And I think that's a little bit where I got to and definitely learned in this period. You know, once you bump into politics, which you do when you deal with ministers in the UK, you see politics and you actually see it's in its raw form, but also in its power or lack of direction or lack of sensible things. One of the more difficult questions that I face and I present my work, particularly to think tanks or aid agencies, is, so what should we do now? You know, what are the policy implications? A general response is, well, I've done the study. Now it's up to you to operationalize this and, and tell me, you know, which parts you find most interesting. So I think it's that kind of reality check that we can come up with lofty ideas but these need to be operationalized. Talking about Amartya Sen, I just got a copy of Home in the World, a memoir, and I'm looking forward to reading this. So, you know, it'll be nice to have Amartya on the show at some point. But just going back to this idea of development, Stefan, in my own work, I often find that development as a concept, you know, it's very difficult to be against it because there's this very positive notion that it's progress, it's forward looking. So in that sense, you know, I think it is really important to go beyond that kind of positive vibe and to better understand who's actually for it, who's fighting against a policy, because I think we have to be a bit more realistic and understand that in some societies, development policies are not always, you know, it does not have the kind of support of all groups, right? So there may be some people who will benefit from a policy, who will then push for it. And there would be lots of people who are very against it. And we have to also be aware of their motives. They may be dragging their feet. So I think there's something about being somewhat realistic. So it's pretty important, I think, to understand that powerful players may be pushing for something and powerful players may be against that. Is that also your take? Because I read these fascinating accounts in your book about all these places that you visited as a DFID official, which may have given you totally different perspectives, right, on what is possible and what is not possible? I definitely learned it, first of all, inside the UK. You know, many of the ideas in the book actually also stem from recognizing that once you see what is possible or what's politically possible for, say, a minister within a coalition of power in its own government, it actually can be very limited. And, you know, yeah. there's, with all kinds of 
narratives, all kinds of public opinion kind of issues as well. But it's definitely my take that when you say it's very hard to be against development, it's very hard to speak out against development. And there's no political leader ever going to, well, maybe you could imagine some, because it's still an idea of modernity, of course, and behind an, an idea of change. But, but simply growing your economy and having some simple version of development, it's hard to be against it, even as a, as a political leader. But of course, what we observe is that any change as you say, brings winners and losers, but especially it can undermine those people that are in power because once you bring in that, you know, whoever controls the setting, their first incentive is usually to stay in control. Mm -hmm. And any change, including development or a growing economy, will imply new groups emerging, certain groups becoming stronger, and so on. And I think it's that reality that definitely we have often underestimated in development. You know this, you'll never find a minister of education against education. You'll never <laughs> find a minister of finance against growth. But actually in their actions, they may be quite happy to do certain things that fundamentally may well end up undermining progress in whether it's education or in, or in the economy. So I'm trying to place your book in relation to very many influential books out there, you know, giving us advice on how to achieve development. And many of these authors, which include friends and mentors of mine, have been on this show. So, for example, Frank Fukuyama and I have discussed, you know, how to get to Denmark. You talk about you know, getting to Sweden, perhaps, in your book. Jeff Sachs and I have discussed the idea of a big push. And I know that you're not a big fan. And I disagree with Jeff that there aren't all of these solutions that we know and that is only about the money. Uh, another mentor of mine, Jim Scott, and I have discussed the role of the state, you know, and why some people want to flee the state. And I was thinking particularly about the last episode in my season three, the last season at Daron Asimoglu, and we discussed the role of institutions, stuff that you also refer to in the book, why nations fail, that hypothesis, but also this sweet spot that they call the narrow corridor, Jim Robinson and Daron Asimoglu that you don't want a too powerful state, you don't want a too powerful civil society, something in between. So generally this feeling in all of these books, some of which you also refer to in your book, that there is some specific policy advice that has offered a recipe, a roadmap, a blueprint. But you're actually pretty skeptical to that. And so let's just firstly discuss why you think that a recipe for development, as I mentioned in some of these books, is not very helpful? It's probably the answer is in two ways. Is, is the first one is that when you look at what countries have done that proved to be quite successful, they all did it a little bit their way. There is no obvious, clear, precise common denominator. Of course, we had, and I think it was in 2007, Michael Spence and others, and I liked that at the time, you know, the Growth Commission report where they talked about, you know, what does it take to get to 7% per year, this kind of 30 years of 7% per year being the metric of success. You know, when it comes down to it to say, yeah, you need to do something about the investment climate, you need to do something about infrastructure, even there, beyond some trivial things, which is, yeah, clearly, of course, you know, you need to do something about your education and your human capital, you need to do something about all these different things and macroeconomic stability matters and you can't just being too crazy about markets and opportunities, but that's still a very broad set of things. And we have this tendency to try to be very precise and maybe in a kind of, as an economist, this kind of first best type of idea of this is the, the thing exactly, you know, and well, and that leads me to that second part because, you know, the first part is really empirically countries did actually quite a diverse set of things. But the other part of it is a bit like, call it normatively, like what advice do you give? And say, well, you find, and maybe it's not, maybe there is a similarity with, with, with at least one aspect here of, of what uh, uh, Darren Asimokoli would say, is that you know, there is this narrow uh, corridor, but it actually is very specific in your country. And it is a lot to do with where you are then, and if you then want to do it at one particular moment in time, you better understand, you know, who are the different players in it. It's not just history that will determine 
whether you'll succeed or not. But actually, then that moment as well. And then, you know, just being very clever about, you know, there's certain blocking interest groups, certain blocking people, maybe in elites, certain risks that elite groups will mobilize popular dissent and being very populist around it and so on. You need to balance this. And then you actually find a way the thing that works at that moment in time to progress. So, and in that sense, the economic policy that Korea did in its early stages or the economic policy of China, it's not so helpful to say, let's all do a Korea or a China because Bangladesh has little to learn from these two countries, let alone, you know, Malawi has very little to learn from these places. So you need to find that. And at the same time, I'm what I like about it as well, rather than making this really difficult task ahead, you know, oh, unless you do a big push, nothing will happen. Or unless you get the institutions perfect, nothing will happen. Actually, I'm trying to say actually, well, something can happen. You know, you may not turn into Singapore, but you can definitely do better than today. And you need to get some of these things aligned. And it's, so it's much more allow, about being willing to be aligned amongst key players in your society and trying out what that path can be for you than anything like a blueprint that you should, you know, just adopt and then do, and as if that will give you success in your own setting. I completely sympathize with that, because the more you think about it, there really isn't a magic bullet. I mean, we are all sort of searching for it. And so the one question, of course, is why do we keep searching for this imaginary magic bullet? Is it that pressure that practitioners have to justify their interventions? It could be academia and policymaking reinforcing this pressure, right? This pressure to generalize, that that you want to learn from experience. And one of the things I really enjoyed in the book is that the problem isn't really about the recipe or the blueprint. It is about the instruction manual, that there isn't that detailed instruction as to, so who's going to do it and what's the first step and at what level. And then there's another set of issues is, as we just discussed, whether one recipe that worked for China I read in the book that your trip to China at one point really changed how you saw things, that that one recipe that worked for China may not work for other parts of the world. So how, how did that journey through China actually change your thinking on development? As a deputy chief economist, so I had moved my office actually for, for many weeks to do my job from Beijing. This is actually almost 10 years ago now. And I was lucky to then interact with a lot of senior officials. The story that I had is that, you know, I want to, I'm interested in Africa. I want to learn about what you're doing in Africa as, as China and understand it better. And what are the lessons from what you do? So they, they took some time to show me all the things they were doing. And we talked about the, the experience and the history. What is it that changed me is that the more I heard from them, the more I saw that I had, that how they had done it, the more I realized is that, how they had done it, no one else could ever do it. You know, that you, you, you do it in China at a very particular moment in time. If we date it in 1979, arguably the institutions were very weak then because that was actually a country in, in chaos after yeah. the revolution and the death of Mao and the Gang of Four. And, you know, and they look for some path that is still consistent with the politics that they were pursuing and at the same time trying to find this, this, this path forward. What changed it really is that, you know, there was almost nothing in the steps that they had set, nor the way they had gone about it in the, their internal politics that you could ever do beyond. And that's where it really changed my mind to say, OK, what's the essence that the world can learn from this? Is that they really wanted to succeed. Yeah. And that they really, from 79, basically said, look, we need to regain legitimacy in the Chinese state. Deng Xiaoping and the reformers had to have legitimacy, at least in the party, that this was the right route to go. And it was a search for legitimacy and progress. And so that's what actually changed me. So there's nothing about, I think, what I call in the book, the flat pack version of China. You know, China's development, you know, special industrial zones, lots of infrastructure in the central state that leads it, that is actually that helpful. That's not what we learn. It's actually, you know, if you want to do it, you better try to see it through you do it in the way you can within your own setup, but totally committed to it, and you're willing to learn while you do it, and you hold yourself to account within it. I think that's what I say. That's that's when it came to dawn upon me. That's 
that's much more relevant for the rest of the world and probably much more in common with other success story than anything specific about what China did exactly and, uh, and even how it actually did it. This brings me to this, you know, what a lot of people term the Chinese model of development. I mean, it, it's very difficult to to trace it to one model and to even talk about that. I, I would even question whether there is one Chinese model of development. But what you do mention, and you do a very good job of in the book, is to actually say that China, like many other countries, and we'll get to this idea of the development bargain slightly late in the conversation, 1978, 79, something happened. There was this agreement. There was a political and economic set of deals that were done. But also, more importantly, that a lot of people don't emphasize enough a robust bureaucratic setup that enabled that kind of mobilization of state capabilities from below. There's one uh, fascinating story in connection to China I read where you mentioned Justin Lin, who I've also had on my show, by the way. And he was asked by someone, it's like, what did China not get right? Because there are always these questions about all the good things, right? And he said, apparently, nothing. There was We got everything right. So I wondered whether you could reflect, Stefan, on what is it that you think China did not do? Because Shenzhen was a success, but there were three other zones that were not a success. What, what were those problems? What, what could they have done even better? When Justin was asked, was everything, ever, was uh, this was actually by the finance minister of Ethiopia at the time, yeah. um, did you succeed in everything you tried? You know? <laughs> and and um, you know, then it becomes really very obvious, of course, that the essence of the model of China was that you know, they were willing to actually experiment and some of the things not terribly successful. And, I mean, you refer to it on the industrial zones, and that actually is very important. In fact, at some point in, in Beijing, at one of these meetings, um, actually in subsequent years, I kept on going back, meeting these same people and reflecting on their experiences and what they, did they do right and wrong. Mm -hmm. There was one of the, an older advisor who had actually been with Deng Xiaoping and berated the young scholars there by actually saying, you've forgotten that actually even three of the four had failed. Exactly. Because even that gets never really reported. And actually it's more important that they didn't continue with the three, at least for then. And then we, we thought it, of course, and we keep on all, always only hearing the, the, the story about the successful one. So, so it's, it's that part of the, of, the, of the Chinese experience. So, so what did they do right or wrong? Well, I think, Another moment of, of insight happened, and it's not recounted in the book, and I thought it was always very amusing, is that we had one of these meetings where they said in the next month, in the, we, we want to renew our model of experimentation. And this were government officials in the Development Research Center, the, a kind of a think tank within the state council, uh, or reporting to the state council. And they kind of said, look, we hear that you do all these RCTs, you know, can you tell us a bit about these things? And of course, it was such a wonderful lead in to them telling, oh, we did something similar. But we couldn't quite, and, and we asked actually, you know, could you then act on it and how did you do it? And in fact, the problem with experimentation was that politics wasn't gone away. And the problem with experimentation was, is that you needed to take your time to learn. Okay, so you would experiment and they would say, well, if a politician failed with something, you know, you couldn't not immediately necessarily punish this person because they may still be politically connected. So you had to wait until this politician was moved to an next post. And by that time, you were allowed to declare it a failure. Yeah. You couldn't do it when they were there. So, you know, politics for them was all the time there as well. This is not a pure technocratic experimentation. Now, you ask me, could they have done that better? For what's for me to judge, and Yan Yan Ang and uh, Yuan Yan could, could uh, judge this probably much better. But clearly, you know, politics was still a constraint, ideology was still a constraint, and so on. And of course, with the hindsight, you would say, obviously, they could have been thinking a bit earlier about green things. And I think citizens in Beijing would love them to have thought a bit more about the location of some of their industries and the wind direction. And so on. So you have these things, 
that clearly, you know, even they in their own politics couldn't quite correct in time and do the, do, do the right things. And I think that's actually quite good, you know, the imperfection of China is in some senses more helpful for the rest of the world to learn from than, than the sense of the, of the perfection. And maybe a small point finally here is that I also agree with you, this idea, there is the Chinese model, because the one that is exported now, they never did it like that. You know, they didn't start with massive infrastructure. That's actually much more in recent decades that the growth was kept going through lots of public infrastructure investment. Now that seems to be the one that's exported. And that's also a little bit, you know, we need to make sure that the right lessons are learned on these things and, and getting the information better. I repeat this argument that Amartya Sen and Jean Drez made many years ago. What really helped China is not that fast economic growth. Of course, that is important, but it was the investments in human development that was made a long time before in the decades preceding. You may or may not agree. It's the it's the doctors and nurses and, and education, et cetera, that in some way made China ready for that takeoff. Do you agree with that, that initial investments in human development were key? I, I would actually slightly turn it around that the, the scale of the poverty reduction we saw from growth was very much helped by this. It's maybe more general point is that you could argue that China for 2000 years was preparing and doing quite a few right things to at some point do better than they did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, they did for 2000 years, uh, you know, centralized bureaucracy, centralized taxation, quite meritocratic bureaucracy. And of course, under the communist doctrine also post, uh, uh, so when they came to power under Mao, they did some of these things as well. So they, you know, they did some of these things. What's then very interesting is that what was then really lacking was actually any model any way within that centralized state that they actually could still do actually economic takeoff. Yeah. And I actually think what they did, what was maybe the final ingredient to mobilize all these things that you described, that you described and I described, is that actually by doing a further governance reform where at least for economic matters, you go lower down, you could unleash this whole thing. But it is important, you know, one of these fascinating conversations happened in Beijing pointed also to something I was surprised by because we were complimenting them actually in the spirit of what you just did, you know, in the kind of talk that you have and say, look, you, of course, you were the countries with the fastest poverty reduction in history over the 1980-2000, and this was an this amazing achievement, and then the whole thing, and, you know, all the other improvements. And they actually felt it important to reply, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, and says, we never planned for this poverty reduction. <laughs> Because actually they're planned for growth. Yeah. And actually, and this is a bit why it's like, like a little bit like say, but because they had actually a healthy workforce and then and a bit and a basic educated well uh, workforce, they could actually get a model whereby they use the only natural source they have, which is people, and keep kept on absorbing that for such a long time. And actually in the process, of course, pushing up wages slowly and getting better wages for people and so on. So, so you've got something there. And it's very amusing that they had to say we didn't plan for the poverty reduction. <laughs> Which really brings me to the meat of your book, The Key Argument, because what really is nice about some of the cases, and you discuss several countries, is you're really trying to understand why some countries implement certain policies that are relatively successful. And and there are some that fail. So it's this combination of success and failures in relation to economic growth and development. And what you do sort of highlight is the presence. What is key is the presence of a, of a development bargain, which you define as some sort of an underlying commitment by a country's elite. These elites are economic, political, social elites that are committed. They want to shape politics, they want to shape the economy and the society with the overall goal of, of economic growth and development. So in this respect, the three key features that you highlight, let me just repeat them and if you could expand on these. One is credible politics that you identify, politics that is durable, political and economic deals that last for a while and are perceived to be legitimate. 
And then there is the second set of issues that is state capability. The state does not take on too much and, and doesn't get too overwhelmed, I suppose. And a final category is the ability and willingness to learn from mistakes. Now, for the benefit of the listener, Stefan, can you expand on each of these very briefly? Well, every society, you, you have in somewhere or another an implicit or explicit elite bargain. Some can be more fragmented, some can be more stable. Now, for development, as a way of reflecting that shared commitment to growth and development, politics needs to be credible enough that you actually, actually keep peace and stability. You know, it's, it's one of the things that I always found amusing um, but truthful is that, you know, whenever I would hear a vice minister from China give a speech on development, they would always say the first and most important thing for development is peace. You know, they're not wrong. You know, it is this basic principle. And of course, it shaped a lot of the thinking of, of China. It has, of course, all kinds of other meanings geopolitically. But it's that minimal thing. You know, peace and stability are these minimal requirements to actually do development. You know, when the elites are so fragmented and there's always forces to destabilize, there is no long-term policy making possible. There's nothing possible in the long term. It's all, all, all basic. So that's the minimal amount. That's, and that's what I mean by critical credible politics. And credible politics is not just leaders saying the right thing, of course. As you already said, it is basically the right political and economic deals because, you know, interest groups need to be brought in. And yeah, sometimes it's a bit of deal making brought, brought into that and whatever, and some access to resources and whatever to do it. The second one, this idea of the self-aware states that I like, really like to push is that states historically and here and now, they're not the same. And it's not just about technical capabilities. You know, some states are, as we referred to earlier to China, built up over centuries as a centralized instrument with a quiet meritocratic bureaucracy and so on. Okay, if you have that, I think you don't make a bad choice to try to have the state lead quite a lot in development. But with states that are just emerging over a couple of decades, and I think yeah. Bangladesh now, a state that emerged after independence in the early 1970s, full of crises, political and famine, actually, in the early 1970s and so on. So really, chaos, really, in the way the state can operate. Your state capability is minimal. So Bangladesh, which I will call a development bargain, definitely in that period, and, you know, still work all the time to renew it, but definitely something there. It probably was more one in terms of giving space to other actors, whether it's private sector or NGOs in the, in the Bangladesh case, to actually do an awful lot of things in ways that probably no other countries, not least in the region, would have been allowed to do. But it's self-awareness, you know, you, you need somehow not to think, as you sometimes hear in African countries, from now on, the state will do all the development. <laughs> yes. Everyone that works in the state in certain countries is appointed there because someone had to give a favor to someone else and not because of capability and maybe you know, there's very, very few people that are there on merit, but most of them are there for any kind of clientelist deal. Don't start thinking that these are the people that can then lead your economy and, and lead your development. So that's what I mean by the self-awareness. So the third thing is this kind of idea of learning. And in fact, since writing the book, and it's actually almost expressing a slight little bit of regret, I've actually realized how close learning and accountability come together. That actually accountability is, is in some sense another one of the possible mechanisms that actually helps you to get learning to take place. You know, because failing can happen, but actually the most important is whether you learn from it. That there is a form of accountability that it actually, in a sense that it matters that failure is recognized, whether it's punished or not, that's not what I mean, but actually yeah, there's a recognition that this part of a government or this part of an economic policy is actually not happening. So we need to be held to account and work hard at improving it. Now, the accountability can be external, maybe like in Ghana through political transitions regularly. It can be more internal, like in functioning bureaucracies or indeed like in China, where you could say there is actually quite a lot of accountability within the Communist Party in terms of the performance. But you need something and learning and accountability. It has to be there. So it also means, and I've been asked that question sometimes, oh, is this just simply about having a national narrative? No, it has to be more than a narrative. You know, narratives matter, and everybody talks about them these days, but it can't just be a story. It needs to be backed up. It needs to be something that actually, there is something there that makes you actually correct the narrative and the stories if you need to learn. 
So here's my take on this, Stefan. Let's begin with the last one. And I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something I've been also thinking about, correcting course, admitting to mistakes, because this is really difficult for politicians to admit that they were wrong. I mean, for me, a credible politician is one who says he or she was wrong. At that time, I thought this was correct. Now I've changed my mind. Here are the reasons why. And I think that would get, in any society, a lot of sympathy. But it takes a lot for a politician to come clean. Having come clean, you can also then strengthen your legitimacy and thereby say, you know, I, you can hold me to account by voting me out of office. I was just thinking about these deals that elites make. And I've discussed this with Kunal Sen and others, you know, who've written a book on deals, etc. It turns out that there's certain deals or certain political settlements that are beneficial and some aren't. In some cases, of course, you can make a political deal, arrive at a settlement that facilitates rapid economic growth, but the benefits of the group don't get translated. You could have inequality, as has been the case in, in China, uneven growth, or, or in Ethiopia, fast economic growth, but not spread. So that's one set of perspectives or reflections on deals. The second has to do with state capacity, which you are also interested in. And we discussed the, the role of a public administration, the bureaucracy, but the key thing for me has been motivated bureaucrats. Are there actually incentives for bureaucrats you know, to do something? So I did a study of you know, Indian civil servants, the Indian Administrative Service many years ago. And the title was the transfer Raj because they were transferred every two, two years or six months and transferred to an unattractive position. And that led to demotivation. And they were transferred because they were either honest or not willing to do what the minister wanted, right? So that led to demotivation and you didn't really want to touch anything. Even though you thought you had some good ideas, you wouldn't pursue it. Overall, I think my, my major reflection on your three key features is that it turns out it's really difficult to coordinate elite action. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. How is it that that kind of deal-making bargaining is coordinated? Because the deals that elites reach can be of different kinds. They could be a democracy bargain, not necessarily a development bargain. Why would they be interested in a development bargain and not something else? That, that is really what I'm wondering about. All the things that you describe and the difficulties that clearly exist with all these three things, it makes it actually quite remarkable that countries are growing. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> and that's actually a little bit what is the thing that gives me hope, you know. My very first essay in development economics in the early 1980s, I had to write in Belgium University the title, Is Bangladesh a Basket Case? Well, that's the Kissinger statement. Exactly. And I did answer, of course, yes, it's a total basket case. Nothing will ever come from Bangladesh. Now I'm praising Bangladesh, actually saying, wow, it found a way of getting its act together. And it found a way of beginning to, to, to progress. So that actually is maybe a first observation. So it does suggest that these you know, elite bargains, these kind of implicit deals, within their imperfections, seem to be emerging at times. You know, it's hard to not think of Bangladesh finding some element of elite cohesion in the, in the late 1970s, early 80s, you know, not getting the kind of reaction, let's kill of the, let's kill of the big NGOs that came maybe a bit later, but the, but or let's 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 push against uh, the, the the private sector entrepreneurs in the garments who initially weren't that politically connected. You know, they were somewhat, they were supported, but they were not really politically connected players. So that's the, that's the thing. It links to this as well is that you know by calling out Bangladesh as a success case and saying, look. I'm quite happy that that's a success. You know, this is quite imperfect institutions. There's definitely a lot of things imperfect there. So there is something there that you need to be willing to say, look, success is actually also defined in relative to your potential. And, you know, Malawi being a success is probably just growing a little bit faster. It will never be Singapore. And so you're willing to actually say something there that gets to act together. And, and it's not seeking perfection here. So you don't want to have this perfect thing. But I'm finally made this point on... They may choose one for democracy, and it's harder for development. And I think that's a really interesting thing. 
you know, and, and, and I'm glad that you make them quite different because, you know, we know democracies, you know, we have Malawi, we have Nigeria, that is not saying they're beautifully functioning democracies, but we know, given what's happening in the US, the US isn't a good well functioning democracy either. In some sense, there is certain things that can happen and so on. And, and political finance matters in all kinds of places to an extent that clearly can't be healthy. And that's not just in Africa. But so you can basically get a bargain elite bargain that, yeah, we'll happy to find a way of transiting power, a bit like, as it was called in Kenya, it's my time to eat now. I mean, Rilo Dinga uh, at the time, people identified it almost as if that was his slogan. And, and, and you know, and that's a bit of Kenyan politics there as well. So, so you can have that. So you could have a democracy bargain as one way of legitimizing your hold on power. What I really like about the idea of development bargains is that it's about regimes, seeking legitimacy, maybe or maybe other reasons as well, but one reason sometimes is also seeking legitimacy, but actually delivering something for people in real terms. And of course, I would love it to be democracies doing this and Ghana to some extent begins to do this. But in the book also, I want to argue, you could have development bargains, countries that are uh, clearly with leaderships delivering for, for legitimacy seeking behavior. And you know, I can't help it, but have at least some admiration for these places as well. Staying on Bangladesh, I'm thinking about how purposive, how targeted are these elite actions? Because it seems to me, and Bangladesh is a great example, that things happened not because they were pre-planned, but by chance, right? So Daewoo starts the garment industry, which has been extremely important for Bangladesh. It isn't as if the elite said, let's focus on the garment industry because we have abundant labor. So it seems that the stars were aligned sometimes. So I'm, I'm just trying to get you to reflect on whether you think this is a very well-coordinated thought of strategy or you, you think you know elites have a general idea and then they just play along as things evolve. It's exactly what you just said. So it is definitely an informal implicit thing that is happening. You could say in China, the shift in 78, 79, was somehow deliberate, but it was not just the whole party wanting to do it. In fact, they had so many opponents within it as well. So people pushed their luck somehow. Could they push this through? In Bangladesh, definitely, it was more a matter of maybe, you know, different individuals understanding we can't make a bigger mess of it than the things we were doing and, and stepping back and giving space and doing it. So it's 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 and it's yeah it is about stars being aligned there's a little bit of luck in it as well it also means it's not easy to observe it in the moment that's happening you know you you see it emerging but the moment itself it's a bit hard to judge whether this is empty words whether this is actions but you know you could see this you know macroeconomic policy started improving in bangladesh they were being more sensible there on it the kind of centralized planning was less, less attention being played on. So you start seeing signs that actually people who can have, that can have uh, doing it get a little bit in, 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 in issue. There are certain drivers of this development bargain that you write about. One is, of course, leadership. We've talked about the quest to seek legitimacy. And then there's this emerging or emergence from conflict. But one aspect that you tend to disagree with, say, the Asimoglu Robinson hypothesis is this prior endowments and history in the overarching scheme of things. Why is that so? There's, there's two things to be said on this kind of, of issue. Of course, history matters. Institutions matter. What the institutional approaches can't quite explain is then why does it then start happening at some point in time? And why does it then happen? <laughs> even in the presence of quite a lot of imperfection, okay? And that's more the kind of thing that I'm alluding to is that there is agency here. You know, there is at some point in time, decisions what individuals take, people in, uh, you know, stepping back, not doing certain things, maybe doing certain things as well, getting coalitions of power of the right thing, of the right, right, right insights together. That's actually what matters as well. So. So this is not like being opposed to it and saying that doesn't matter, but it's like, we can't just wait until perfect institutions emerge. 
no country ever ever developed with its perfection in place. And that's probably what I more want to allude to. And that's where, where it's a bit more, more different. It doesn't mean that some of the actions that you may want to do, but the policy advice that you also get from this kind of view is a little bit, bit annoying because it basically tells you, you know, well, you had a bad history, therefore yeah. uh, you can't do anything. You know, get yourself a better history. And that's a little bit also unsatisfactory because that's, that's not helpful to anyone. For a long time, for years, we've known as academics, as practitioners, that local knowledge is important. You know, doing the homework is important. Understanding local politics is important for all aid agencies working there. You can't just have a helicopter approach. So how does aid fit into your analysis? I'm thinking about countries like Malawi that I've been studying for many years and are increasingly um, aid reliant. Can aid be a catalyst, a facilitator to promote a development bargain? Is it at all possible for aid to have this goal? Because I'm thinking about local elites need to be provided with some incentives for this political settlement, for this development bargain. At the same time, you don't want to impose certain conditionalities. So what are your thoughts there? So, so I think humility is a good starting point here. You know, in terms of, you know, we are outsiders. We may have the best intentions, and I hope we do. Also, whether we work as you know international agencies, bilateral agencies, and so on. But somehow there has to be something locally that you can work with. So I like to think of it a bit like dancing the tango. Mm -hmm. If you want to dance the tango, you better be both totally committed to wanting to dance the tango. That's what they've been saying about ownership all these years. Yes, exactly. But the question you have to ask with ownership is of course who owns the country and who are the ones that actually you're dealing with? Because yeah. if they want to dance the polka and <laughs> development involves the tango, it's going to be a mess, okay? So, you know, we can't dance the tango and they do the polka and then think something good will come out of it. And it's a bit like that, you know, the organizations, the part of government, could be local government, whatever level it is. If there is a serious commitment to make things work, then I think, you know, we can do something. But this idea of, you know, well, they vaguely say they want to do something, but actually fundamentally the game in town is something very different. The commitment of the elite is about something very different is, you know, you know these things, the redistributive politics, just keeping in power, clientelism, whatever it is. Then you say, well, there's not that much. Well, to start with, you should have humility in terms of how much you can do. Now, do I want to give up on Malawi? Um, I've been getting a bit in trouble on Twitter because I seem to be giving up on, on, on Malawi. And there are moments that I do because, you know, we, we've been doing development work and they've been very welcoming for development agencies for 60 years. And we've done an awful lot. But actually, fundamentally, I don't think the elite, and that's not about one politician, you know, there's, there's sometimes very well-meaning politicians there, but Across the board, the way the incentives are set, not much is happening. And then you kind of say, look, what are we doing? Now, then it becomes this whole tricky thing, you know, how do you shift the incentives? Can you as outsider do this? Well, you can try a little bit, but you want to be very careful. But I'll give you an example of what you can do, probably. If there are in these countries people that generally want to do reform, say they are put in charge, they have some mandate on some particular agency within it, you know, just be willing to do a little bet on them, give them the support, try to actually see where they can do it. And if I go back in time in across Africa, where I would say in the 1980s, 90s, very difficult times, but elite commitment was very hard to find in a lot of places. Actually quite a lot of places, for example, central banks got strengthened in a way that they became more sensible and reasonable. And they, you know, there's a lot of countries where you now have quite able uh, central bankers with decent people that actually try to keep the economy stable as much as they can do. You know, as you have it in some countries like it used to be the, the governor uh, in Uganda, uh, you know, at times telling Museveni off that he can't just uh, get all access to all the money and let inflation run riot and make people suffer. When, during an election, after an election campaign and so on. So, so there's bits and pieces you can do, but have some humility that we are outsiders.
on that note, you discuss in the book your interactions with Ethiopian officials over the years who may not have had a very sophisticated World Bank kind of language when talking with you and others, and yet seem to have had political backing, commitment in order to implement this. I'm talking about the time Meles was the supreme leader. Unlike your experiences in the DRC, where you have a fancy group of economists telling you all the right stuff, but you go away feeling that they may not be able to implement it. So I think in many ways, Stefan, aid agencies are stuck in that, I suppose, I wouldn't say stuck, but they face that challenge, right? That you have people at the, on the other side of the table telling you we are committed, but you're not really sure whether they will follow up. And coming back to Malawi, you recount your interactions with the then Minister of Agriculture, who told you all the right things. He, he agreed with all your proposals. And then a few months later, he's been indicted for corruption and he's out of office. So how do aid agencies actually grapple with that? You can't say, oh, I doubt what you're saying. You're not really committed. So the tango is there, but you don't know how well that dance will be performed later on. So that's also a gamble. That's also a risk as I see it. Exactly. And, and, and I wouldn't want us to shy away from us as development partners, not to take that risk. You know, it's, I'm not, this is not an appeal to be totally risk averse, probably actually to the contrary, is to, to see whether, first of all, where you do have signs that something is really trying to happen, be willing to support them. Yes, Melis, you mentioned him, Melis and Avi, it was complicated. Politically, it was complicated. It was, you know, quite, quite repressive against certain groups and so on. It was definitely not a democracy, but something was going on that for, for the first time in, in almost ever, leadership wanted to develop and wanted to actually do something. Now, you know, we, we have so much baggage down with us in terms of can we support, can we not support? I remember data from, uh, this was actually an after Malice of death, but I would actually say this continued definitely also between 2010 and, and all the way up to almost the beginning of the conflict, where there was that underlying commitment to try to make it work. But then while there is of course concession of finance in the world, the top three countries in that period ends up being Nigeria, the DRC and Pakistan where countries that actually were trying to do something, yeah, not perfectly, whatever. But I'm thinking here, say, of Cote d'Ivoire, that was beginning to do things, Senegal, and of course, Ethiopia and Rwanda, and Ghana was there as well. I think all of them ended up going to the, to the bond market to raise capital to pay for their development, you know, and there's all kinds of issues with what Ghana did and so on. And they, but they're now stuck with kind of a much more difficult financial situation. And now you kind of say, well, are we betting the right horses? Are we betting on the right horses, you know? And that's a bit what we want to do. So there is a lot of talk. Yeah, we do this in practice. In fact, some of the criticism I've been getting on some of my writing is saying, oh, but that's all standard one-on-one of how you do development support. But actually in practice, we don't because we are in the same way approaching Malawi as we are Ghana or as we approach Ethiopia in that period. So that's a bit also what I want to bring out, you know? you. You don't behave as if, and this is a bit of humility, if things are totally stuck in Sierra Leone or in Malawi, as I write about in my book, then you say, well, don't think that keep on bringing in finance and all kinds of big projects will change that much. Then maybe you actually step back for a bit and say, look, we do small things. We do it very selectively. And then you start being a much more selective model in, in how you deal with it. And you're willing to be, again, a bit more humble and saying, look, I can't see very well how I can do much in Malawi at the moment, rather than, you know, Malawi is a country, I think every NGO in the world is present there, every bilateral agency is present. It's such a benign place, they welcome you. Well, because to be honest, too many people in, in seeing in power don't care. So they're all welcoming you. So my take on this is uh, Malawi is such a great place to experiment. It's, it's a donor darling. One reason is because Malawian politicians never say no. I've been telling them to say no more often, you know, like Paul Kagame does. But I actually was recently there and they said, the reason why we don't say no is because there's so many challenges. Anything that anybody can do, even if it's a little bit, 
is good. So we welcome it. But certain other things that, you know, I just want to raise here, Stefan. One is, of course, that from the aid agency perspective, I, I agree with you about the humility aspect, but you want to convince your people, the taxpayers back home, that everything is fine, your money well spent, you've invested all of these hundreds of millions, you don't want to pull out. And then there's this other aspect, you know, saying if we pull out, if we are very strict and we extract too much accountability, what about people living in poverty? They will suffer. Why should we punish them when we're trying to punish the elites? So you have that complex system that makes it very difficult to ask or to be even comfortable talking about the uncomfortable questions. But you touched on something really important. And I think this is something I felt so uncomfortable with in my peers working inside government. You know, there we are, probably, you know, I would say like as different, we were on the moral high ground, okay? So it's a really safe place to be, it's really great. We were doing, trying to do our best in kind of places. But then somehow, because we want to this whole thing to keep on continuing, we are to some extent amongst almost the most dishonest people in terms of telling it to our own to our own audiences. Because yes, we know there's only a small fraction of the people who either want to uh, understand it or do understand it. And there's a slightly larger group that cares, but you know, they want what you describe, well, at least make sure you do it all perfectly. And we've started telling stories, you know, whether we are an NGO or whether you're an aid agency is that from a small thing like, you know, we know how to get these people out of poverty to the other big level of, oh, well, the whole world is now united and suddenly by 2030, everything will be sorted. It's that kind of dialogue. I just, I find it so troubling and I'm just looking for a way to be slightly more honest about it. And I'm not saying that my language will do it because I already experienced that it will give some ammunition to people who really against any of us trying to actually make a difference in these places. But at the same time, you know, we need to find a slightly more honest conversation, even with our parliaments, with our uh, politicians, and indeed with our public in, in the donor countries, because it's not right either. You are skeptical, you have been, about these major global goal projects, uh, the fact that they are non-binding, etc. And I share some of your concerns. Some of us are, of course, thinking about the post-2030 agenda now, because, you know, we're not going to make 2030 at all. It looks pretty bleak. What is your advice to anybody working on global development? How should we view the SDGs for the next seven years going forward? My skepticism is a lot to do with, you know, the creating the impression that the commitment is actually credible and serious. Countries who really want to develop and do the right thing, they don't need to go to New York to be on a photograph on the Millennium Declaration or sign a document uh, of the SDGs. Countries that don't care, we actually give them an excuse because they are on that same picture, they are in the same places and so on. So this kind of idea of the global coalition where everybody in it doesn't feel to me like the way we make best progress. Sometimes you could say, well, the SDGs in the progress, you could say, well, maybe it's a coalition of the willing. Okay, so maybe you go to a framework where you actually try to really get people on board that, that really want to do it in places and, and, and so on. But again, I'm not quite sure what it actually will do beyond, you know, the idea of a peer group, a group that actually holds itself to account and, and, and encourages each other. I can see in practice, that's probably where it works. It's a bit like where I'm thinking of, you know, if you get a couple of countries in Africa, like five or six or seven, that actually in the next couple of years, keep on making progress and doing really their best, you know, you could, you could see them as well. So, someone yesterday was talking to me in a very different context of coalitions of the unlikely. And I think that's maybe where we need to go to, to actually find countries that actually are the similar to Henry Kissinger kind of basket cases uh, of the Bangladeshis of the 1980s and actually saying look, we, we're actually going to really do anything we can with all the humility but really encourage you to within your own country to get somehow an elite bargain that's that's stronger and we'll commit to it to support it if we can forge it and so on you know you you, you do certain things Maybe these are the kind of agendas, you know, with a, with a fragmented geopolitics, 
maybe it's actually the realistic way of going about it. If we want to portray, and, and you mentioned things like human rights and democracy and so on, if you want to portray Western values as, as being something that are also worth being part of this whole thing, well, then, then work with that, you know, work with that countries that want to do it, support them stronger. I would say, you know, make a central part, of course, the developmental and the growth part of it, and maybe we can do it. But I'm, I'm just skeptical of, of the illusory sense of a global coalition, where actually the world is so deeply fragmented. You know, things need to come from below, from these countries. They need to be serious and need commitment. I think our role as outsiders is to support whenever there's emerging strong elite commitment. And then really we should go full out uh, on supporting that. Thank you so much for this fantastic, enjoyable conversation over two days, by the way. Thank you very much, Dan. If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to in pursuit of development at gmail.com.